chapter 2, as we read God's word out loud, I'll only be reading three verses this morning. And that's our context. That's our study this morning. Second Peter chapter 2, looking at verses 1, 2, and 3. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. You may be seated. Dear Father, dear Lord, we come ready to hear your word. We come looking forward to the communion table as well. We come with full attention, focusing on you. We know that this, this time together is important. Remind us of the importance and the value of the scriptures. Strengthen us in you. Our desire is to know more of you. As we concentrate on you, show us how much we need you. We need you in our lives. We need you in our thinking. We need you in our marriages. We need you in our family. We need you in all relationships. You need to be Number one, your goodness has been through the passage, through the passages that we'll read this morning. We need you this morning. I pray that you would help the speaker. I pray that you would help the listener. And then I pray for those who will listen to this message outside of this time. And I pray. I pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the tender Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. You can buy fake watch. You can buy a fake watch. Uh, I would not know the difference between a real Rolex and a non-real Rolex. In fact, I heard a story the other day that uh, two guys were talking about a Rolex, and they decided to take the Rolex to a jeweler. And so the jeweler looked at both of the Rolexes, and he said, they look very good. They're very, they, they look identical. They look similar. And so the two guys asked the jeweler, well, which one is the fake? And he said, I can't tell. And so he said, if I open the watch, disassemble it, I can tell which one is fake and which one is real. Even a jeweler was puzzled by its genuineness, by its authenticity. You can buy fake art. There's a lot of money to be made in fake art. And did you realize that you can also buy fake money? Really, you can buy fake money. And I know... I know the ladies are going to get mad at me, but I wrote this after I wrote this sermon. You can also buy fake eyelashes. I know some of you didn't know that. There are always so many, there are so many counterfeits, so many counterfeit things. Everything that God has produced, Satan comes along and he makes a copy, or as some would say, he makes a counterfeit. He makes fake things. God's items are always genuine. And Satan's stuff is not. Paul the Apostle 
writes to a little group of people called, they're, they're a little group of people in a city called Corinth. And those he's pointing out, he's pointing out to the people in Corinth, there are fakes in the church. I know you find that hard to believe, not at Drexel. But turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I just want to set the course on where we're headed this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I want us to look at just a couple of verses in, in, first Corinth, in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 13 through 15. Just, just as a way of an introduction 2 Corinthians chapter 11. That's where we want to look at this morning as we begin our, our time together. And I want to say thank you for uh, being with us. And if uh, you don't have a Bible, uh, we'll get it up on the screen. If there's a Bible in your, your pew, you can also turn there. Look at verse 13. For such men are false apostles. Paul, writing to the Corinthians... He says, there are some false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as an apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Look at verse 15. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness whose sin will be according to their deeds. There's always been a problem with the genuine and the fakes. Satan is the imposter. Satan is also called the deceiver. And since he deceived Eve, all the way in the book of Genesis, he wants to confuse and manipulate and deceive the church of Jesus Christ. It has always been an issue in Christendom, the genuine and the fake. He has, he has and we'll see here in just a second, his, he has on his side false Christians. He has a false gospel. He has a false righteousness. And one day, he will present to the world a false Christ. One day, people will be confused about what's true and what's not true. And as long as you keep reading the scriptures, you'll, you'll feed your soul and you'll know the difference between what's counterfeit and what's genuine. The United States government do not train people with fake money. They always train their agents, inspectors of what's genuine. So when they see that fake $50 bill come by, they know which one's fake. It always, it all, always humors me. I don't carry $50 bills on me. I don't carry $100 bills on me. And when the teller wants to give me a 50 or a 100, I said, please don't give me that. Because when I use it, they think I'm a drug dealer. <laughs> but it always humors me when I go to the store and I'm in line patiently. And a customer ahead of me hands the cashier a $100 bill or a $50 bill. And what's the first thing the cashier does? It's always comical. Thank you, Ted. It's comical. They show it to the light. And I'm, I, 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 I'm not supposed to judge. I'm just chuckling inside of me. And I said, did this person really know the difference between a real and a fake? One day, the world will be introduced to a false Christ, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? Many, many will be deceived. Sad to say, many will be deceived. The nation Israel 
was constantly being led astray by false prophets. Because the religion and the false prophets would come and the, the people would get comfortable when they had their ears tickled. And it was real popular even today for the preacher to give a message to those in the audience, those in the pew, to say, wow, I really like that message because it makes me feel good. There used to be a guy who used to come to our church and he'd come and sit in the pew and he would leave and he would shake my hand at the end of the service and he said, you know, I don't like coming here. And I said, how come? We don't have coffee? We don't have donuts? Why, why don't you? Why don't you say? Because he, he says, every time I come, you cost me money. Really? He says, yeah, because I have such a grip on my money, I want to give it back to God. I said, amen. He says, oh, I don't like coming here because every time I come here, you know, you make me feel bad. I said, really? I said, me or, or what I say or what the word says? You see, there are fake preachers, and there are those who are genuine. I can tell you what you want to hear, but I will not be, do a service to you or a service to God if your soul is satisfied and you're on your way to hell. That's not good. In fact, when we look at this text, it's a very difficult text. We see, we see and we'll read the word destruction. And Peter is being very strong here in his writing. He almost sounds like the, the Apostle Paul. And he uses another word, not a, not a very nice word, damnation. And then if you stick with us next week, or he catches on YouTube, he uses illustration like Noah. And then he uses an illustration like Sodom and Gomorrah. No. Peter knew the issue at hand. Peter knew how important the scriptures are. And he knew that the fake people will come and move people away from the truth of God. I challenge people often what I say when I teach to go back and read it on your own, to ponder what I said, to think about what I said. In fact, I'm, I'm easy to be corrected. Ask, ask Tim. Ask my wife. Ask those who listen to me on a regular basis, did you really mean what you said? And, and, and thank God that I can come back next week and say, hey, you know what? Maybe you misinterpret me. And there are people who will say, did you really mean that? And I thank God because I can go back next week and pick up where I left off. And I would say, as we say in basketball, I dropped the ball. The fact that the false prophets preached a false peace did not worry the people of Jerusalem, the people of the Old Testament. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 6, verse 14, this is what it says. They have healed the brokenness of my people, superficially saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. It was a message. That was a message that they wanted to hear. And the apostles and the prophets, if you've been reading the Bible any length of time, you know the prophets and the apostles, they put the foundation for the church. The foundation of the church. They knew the importance and the value of scriptures. Ephesians chapter 2, they made this foundation. And Peter is writing about false teachers rather than false prophets because they are still teachers in the church. They don't listen to the false prophets. They don't listen to the prophets, but they would listen to the teachers of the word. And Satan always uses an avenue to be successful by manipulating the word of God. Satan always uses that to be manipulative. Now, Peter warns us, and he says, he says to us, be alert. The false teachers here in the Greek uses the word, another word for plastic, fake. They use the same language. And you know, you and I have met people 
who talk about the scriptures, who know the lingo, who know the terminology, and they use the same words as we use. I love it when people come and they want to talk to me about the scriptures. I know a little bit. I, I love it because they don't know my perspective and where I'm coming from. I love it when they talk to me about scripture, when they, we use the same language. The only problem is they have a different dictionary. Satan uses a particular avenue, and he uses the avenue of Scripture, and they're quite successful. Peter is saying here to be very careful because those, those, those teachers are plastic. Plastic. You know, plastic, the stuff that you use during a party so you don't have to wash them. You know, the plastic stuff that you bring at picnics and you just throw it in the waste bag, and you don't care about the landfills. You know the difference between a plastic fork and a real fork. Yeah, there is a difference. I have a problem with plastic forks because they're always breaking. But there's a realness of what's genuine and then the fake. Peter warns us to be alert. He says there are false teachers. They use the same language but they don't use the same dictionary. And in this chapter here, we're going to see deception. We're going to also see the word, or we're going to understand, we're going to look at the word denial, and also sensuality. Because false teachers want to gratify their flesh. Want to gratify their flesh. They want to, they want to satisfy what the carne wants, what the flesh wants. And what ruins men and women of God are three things. One of the things that ruins a, a man of God, a woman of God, it's not in my notes. I, I want to say it now because I'm remembering it. The, in sensuality, there are three things that ruin every man, every man and every woman of God. Those who profess to know God, those who are teachers and those who are not teachers, there's three things that will ruin a man and a woman of God. Number one is their pride. Number two is the love of money. And number three, when they love somebody that's not their spouse. Those who ruin the men and women of God. And I've seen men and I've seen women who are serving the Lord. But when it comes to those three areas of their life, sensuality. And that's what Peter will be addressing shortly if we get to it. And the fourth thing that Peter is addressing is greed. Greed. Deception, denial, sensuality, and greed. It's in the text. And these three verses that we're, we're trying, I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to get there. These three verses that, that Peter is writing, it's for us as well. He's writing to the church then, but he's also writing to us today as we look at the scripture. This is a sad a chapter in the Bible. This is a very sad chapter in the Bible, but it's also an important chapter for us to study. And as we look at the scriptures, we go book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, precept by precept, principle by principle, because God is teaching us. And here we see in this chapter that the teaching of false and fake teachers is sometimes, sometimes or many times, flattery. We know what flattery is, right? I like when people say, oh, well, Pastor Dan, you, you look like you're losing weight. That's flattery. <laughs> Stop it. Okay? The, the next thing that we'll see here in this chapter is their ambition is financial. Financial. You've seen them on TV. You've seen them on the internet. Please send your last $20 or, or else we'll go off the air. And I'm saying don't send the $20. The other thing we'll see here in the lives of those who are false or fake teachers, their life is, has corruption. They have a corrupted life. And the conscience that a false or a fake or a plastic teacher has is their conscience is dull. 
And their aim, their aim of a false teacher is deception. Now, ladies and gentlemen, let me, let me, let me set the stage here. This is not those who are outside the church. Peter's addressing, they sneak in the church. I remember one day I was preaching and I dropped some names, some names that I will not drop this morning. And in different times I'll drop people's names, those sometimes celebrities or politicians, or those who are corrupt. I'll drop their names unconsciously. I don't like to do that. And this happened in two, two different specific time some people caught me at the door and they said you know I, you know you said that about her and I don't believe that or you know you said that about what's his name I, I don't think that's true of what's his name and then uh, weeks went on and months went on and sure enough both of these icons that I mentioned their name fell and they fell hard Pros False prophets, that's what Peter is saying here in verse 1. False prophets, false teachers, secretly, he says, secretly introduce destructive heresies. They speak destructive heresies, denying the master, those who had saved them, who brought them out of their bondage, bringing sift destruction to them. Peter's word is strong. Yeah, this is the same Peter. They took his eyes off Jesus, and he began to sink. This is the same Peter that said, Lord, we'll get him. This is the same Peter that went to sleep. This is the same Peter that denied him three times. Yes, this is the same Peter. And he learned his lesson. And he writes such an important chapter, such an important, and we looked at 1 Peter already, we're now in chapter 2 of 2 Peter, looking at what Peter writes. So he says the false prophets. He says, but he says here, Peter describes the false teachers in detail in this chapter. In fact, many writers say that chapter 2 of 1 Peter shouldn't be chapter 2. It should be a continuation of chapter 1. Because if you remember... Peter writes, verse 21, chapter 1, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit and spoke from God. The Holy Spirit. The tender Holy Spirit. Not man's writing, but God's writing. God breathed. The word of God, he breathed it. And the greatest sin of Christ's rejection, Christ's uh, rejectors, and the most damning work of Satan is the misrepresentative of truth, of the truth and the consequence of deception. Truth. Truth. Maybe some of you grew in a home, grew up in a home where you can tie a lie anywhere but you could never bring a lie home because this is where truth begins and truth ends here. Nothing is more wicked than, than someone to claim to speak for God, for God, for the salvation of souls when in reality he speaks for Satan and the damnation of one's soul. And that's what Satan wants to do. For those who know the truth, he won't be able to misguide them, but he wants to come to get those who think they're saved. He wants to come and target those who don't know the word of God. That's why the cults, when they come knocking on your door, if you have not studied, you cannot attack them. You cannot defend what you believe. And I love to get those cults. And I love to remind them what's in chapter 13, second paragraph. And they look at me with deer in headlights. I said, don't you have the blue book anymore? Oh, it's at home. I said, when you go home, you turn to page 13, the second paragraph, and then you call me. We'll go, we're not supposed to have lunch with them. But you call me, and then we'll discuss it. Nothing is more wicked than someone who claim to speak for God, but they don't know the word of God, and they're not thinking about salvation of souls. Satan 
wants to damn the souls of people. Look with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, which is our memory verse of the week. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Uh, I have a friend that memorizes scripture. And he's about my age. And he says to me, he asked me the other day, Dan, learn, are you memorizing any scripture? And, and he convicts me every time I talk to him. So his, when his name pops up on my phone, I said, oh, no, I hope he doesn't ask me that question. But our memory verse of the week is found in Matthew chapter 7, verse, verse 15. Very appropriate to our, our text. This is what he says. Be on guard. Against the false prophets. False teachers. Who come in sheep's clothing. But inwardly. They're raging wolves. Now, now we've been talking about the shepherd. We've been talking about the pastor. The shepherd who who takes care of the sheep, who pads them, and then they come in, and, and, and the shepherd guides, he leads, and he cares, and he feeds them, and he helps them to come along. Matthew 7 tells us to be very careful because those sheep come in, those wolves come in, and they're dressed like the sheep, but if you remove their covering, they are nothing but a wolf. And what do wolves like? They love carne asada. They really do. They come in. They come in and then they ravage. They ravage and take advantage of the church. Over 900 weeks ago when I arrived here, there was a group of people in leadership at this church. And they asked me, um, Pastor Dan, uh, we want to give you a Sunday off. Uh, uh, I said, I'm, I'm fine. I, 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 that's what you pay me for. I preach and pray. That's my job description. No, we want you to take a Sunday off. And I was like, how come? Oh, we're bringing this group in. And they're going to sing, and the message is going to be in the singing. I said, really? Well, you know, you, you hire me as a shepherd. You, you call me to be the pastor. Um, I said, call them back up and tell them not to come. Well, we can't do that. I said, what do you mean you can't? Did, did you sign a contract? Then you pay them, not me. And don't take it out of the church offering. Because, see, I believe the most important thing on Sunday is the word of God. I didn't know the background. And they probably were, they said, well, we always use this group. Every, we use it all the time. And they stayed in our mission house. And, and we love them. And they sing good. And when I feel good. And all the good stuff. And I said, no. It got real quiet in the room. Like it is right now. But I didn't know where they were coming from. Because I think the holy hour is at 11 o'clock all across the country. And churches that don't open the word of God on Sunday are doing a discredit. And the, the wolves come in and they rip the sheep up. The people used here in the New Testament of Israel, Acts 26. Peter's point here is that Satan has always, has always interfered infiltrated the groups of believers and he's always been a deceiver he's always coming after people because he's a false teacher the book of John chapter 8 verse 44 if you're taking notes look with me in your Bibles to John chapter 8 verse 44 in your, in your Bible as a, as a cross reference and he's and he's saying here, John is saying, you are the father, you're devil. And you want to do the desires of the father. You're a murderer from the beginning and does not stand to the truth. Look at the word truth there. Satan doesn't give a rip about truth. It's not important to him. Deception, leading people down a way to hell, that's his priority. And when is the church going to understand that? There's, there's, there's a truth and then there's error. 
And I pray and I hope that people will always desire the truth of God's word. There is no truth in him. And whenever he speaks, he speaks a lie. He speaks from his own nature. For he is a, say it with me, he is a what? Liar. One more time. He is a what? Liar. Satan's a liar. Why do we listen to him? And he's the father of lies. He's a liar and the father of lies. And here's a sad commentary, ladies and gentlemen. Even though we know he's a liar, even though we know he says lies, people still believe him. Every Sunday morning, all across the food of plain in the United States of America, people will walk into churches and they don't look for truth. They look for what's lying so they can feel good when they leave. When my friend or when that guy who used to come to our church said, I, you know, I really feel bad after listening to you. And I said, good. Go home and repent. Maybe you feel bad for a reason. Now remember, remember, God may be speaking to him. And, and any time a person feels guilty about listening to the word of God, maybe God is telling you something. Maybe he's telling you something. Since Eve has been the deceit from the beginning, he continues to deceive them. Remember, if you remember anything this morning so far, Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Be on your guard, ladies and gentlemen. Be on your guard against false, fake, plastic prophets, plastic teachers who come in sheep's clothing but inwardly are raging wolves. One of the saddest things I heard from a new Christian one day, they came to me and they said, Pastor, we want to go to this Bible study. And I'm listening. I'm trying to be a good shepherd. I listen. I do listen. Right, Ted? Don't I listen every now and then? I, I do listen. So uh, they were telling me, this new Bible study, this new discovery, this is a new Bible study. I'm listening, I'm listening for the other shoe to drop. And then she said this, we're going to grow more. New and improve. We're going to grow more. And ladies and gentlemen, I've been teaching the Bible for a little length of time. The only way you and I will grow is when we sit alone with the word of God. And we study it. Verse upon verse, by verse upon verse, passage upon passage, and when, when our tears weep and fall on the pages of Scripture, we've been there and God speaks to our heart. I hope you understand that my job is to get you excited about the Scriptures so you can go home and read the Scriptures again, and you can read them again and apply it to your life. I love the scriptures. I love to teach the scriptures. I like to talk about the scriptures, but I need to be alone with the scriptures just like you need to be alone. And the Bible says so that you will grow in grace and knowledge of the scriptures. The Bible says they come in secretly. Let's go back to Peter. Peter, in chapter 2, verse 1, they come in secretly and they introduce destructive heresies. False Teachers show themselves as Christians. They show themselves as pastors. They show themselves as teachers. They show themselves as evangelists. Jude, verse 4. Jude, that's one of the books that maybe you ought to read every month. The book of Jude, 28 verses. The book of Jude, verse 4. I like to read the book of Ecclesiastic because it tells me that my time is running out. We all know that. None of us are always going. None of us are going to be young and good-looking like Silas one day. We're going to all come to an end. That's why I like Ecclesiastics, because it tells me, "Hey, you're going to turn the light off one day," uh, or we say in the in the Vario Puvo, "One day you're going to turn the light off. Somebody's going to turn the light off. You can't be on forever." And the second thing is in the Book of Jude, it tells us about the deception that's always ahead of us. Look at verse 4. For certain persons, in the book of Jude, up on the screen, certain persons have crept in unnoticed. 
Oh, when did you get here? Oh, I've been here six months. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly persons who turned the grace of God into lecise, how do you say that word? Thank you. And deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. And the book of Jude and Peter could almost be, could, could always, uh, they are book, two different books, two different audiences. They complement each other. When you read First Peter, read also the book of Jude. They've come in. They come in to take advantage. And the word heresies there, we look here, the heresies is like a, a strong opinion. And the word heresy could also mean that people come in and they get a group of people who say, you know, you really believe what Dan is saying is truthful? Have you looked at it this way? And their idea is to, again, like Satan, manipulate, take advantage. Self-designed religious lies, which leads to division. One writer said these are, are facts, groups, particular party that causes division causes a challenge in what is said usually. The Greek word for destructive basically means damnation. The word is used six times here in this letter, and it also speaks of the final damnation. This is why it is a tragic thing for the church, a tragic thing for the church, for those who, who listen to this particular teaching and know that that the people who grab this teaching will fall away from Scripture. Turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Paul, the apostle, addresses his young protege, his young disciple in the Lord. 1 Timothy chapter 4. I want you to look to verses 1 through 5. 1 Timothy chapter 4 beginning with verse 1. He says, but the Spirit explicitly says that in lighter time, some will fall away from the faith. There's not a week that goes by when somebody will ask me about so-and-so. Oh, what happened to Bill? Or what happened to Mike? Or, I haven't seen Mary for a while. Ladies and gentlemen, every generation, people fall away. I believe they fall away for two reasons. Number one, they've not fed their soul. Or number two, they never believed. Because if you believe, you're going to stick with it to the end until you go be with Jesus. But Paul writes to Timothy, but the Spirit says, in latter times, some will fall away from the faith, from the faith paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Another word for doctrine is teaching. And there's so much bad teaching out there. There's so many people wanting you to buy this book or wanting you to get this magazine or want you to buy this DVD. And today, you don't even have to pay for it. All you have to do is go to YouTube and you get all kinds of teaching. You don't have to buy CDs anymore. But it's on the internet and it's free. Verse 2 of this same chapter, verse 2, by the means of hypocrisy. They're hypocrites. They're, they're liars. There we go again. Seared by their own conscience with a branding iron. Verse 3. Let me look at verse 3. It says, men who forbid marriages and advocate abstaining from food, which God has created to be gratefully shared by those who believe and know the truth. There's all kinds of teaching. Remember, the fake, plastic, and the real. And Satan comes and he challenges what God has ordained as good. Comida is good. Amen. All, all the people say amen. We agree with that. But when it comes to certain restrictions, so you know, you got to go some restrictions because you, if, you, you, if you don't eat that much, if you do this, X, Y, and Z, when it comes to food, you get closer to God. Don't you want to get closer to God? Yeah, but I like to do it with my belly full. I really do. Gratefully shared by those who believe and know the truth. 
the truth is worth, always worth fighting for. That's why we opened it. In, we started an institute here to train men and women to know the scriptures so when they're in their church, they can teach what the word of God says. Thus saith the Lord. I was talking to a man outside of, the United, outside of Arizona. He was looking for a church. He says, Dan, I can't find a church in my city. He's outside of Arizona. Can't find a church where he lives that the preacher would get up and open the word of God. He says, I've been to a dozen churches. Doesn't anybody ever get to the pulpit? Doesn't the preacher of God ever open the word of God and say, thus say it, God? He says, I'm sick and tired of how many ways to improve your marriage? How many ways to save money? How, how to make your grass look pretty on Sunday morning? He says, I'm tired of these messages. Why can't they just open the word of God and teach it the way God designed it? False prophets. Plastic teachers. You know why? Because I don't think they value the truth. And we're going to find out in a second what's also the big deal about false teachers. Uh, verse 4. Verse 4, the same chapter. For everything created by God is good. Amen? Amen. God is good, isn't he? Most of us slept in a house yesterday. Most of us shaved. Well, not everybody shaved. But most of us had a breakfast. Most of us, and, and, and nothing to be rejected or received with gratitude. I'm grateful for what the Lord has done for us so we may enjoy living here on, the, on this earth. Last verse, verse 5. But it's, sanct uh, but it's sanctified by means of the word of God in prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to ask you a personal question. Did you read the word of God this week? Did you pray this week? Let's go back to verse 21. Let's go back to no, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1 in First Peter. The phrase exposed the depth of the, of the crime and gui of, 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 of guilt of the false prophets. Go back to First Peter. That's where I'm at. Thank you. Who was secretly introduced, destructed, denying the master, and brought him, bringing swift destruction to themselves. The, the Greek word here, Lord, appears ten times in the New Testament. I mean, one who's supreme authority, the master here. I'm talking about the master. It's here has complete authority. Peter warns the false prophet, denying the, sovereign, the sovereignty or the lordship of Jesus Christ. Through their heresies, many of them include, this is, what, this is what the heresies around during Jesus' days, the same heresies arise today. Every so often, people question the virgin birth. And Tim picked the song that talked about the virgin birth. That is essential. That is important. That Mary was a virgin when Christ came onto the scene. A heresy today that said, ah, oh, it could have just been any woman. No, prophesies it had to be a young woman who was a virgin. That's a heresy back then, it's a heresy today. Another heresy today is the deity of Christ. You ask a person who's knocking on your door or a person who's talking to you about the things of God, ask them what is their position or what is their teaching about Jesus Christ. Is he God? We believe he is. We believe in a triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Also, the heresy back then, today, is whether or not Jesus resurrected bodily. A heresy. We believe he did. And the second heresy, another, me, another heresy is the second coming of Christ. Christ talked about his second coming. There are people today who say, no, no, he, it's all, he's already here. And the other thing that Peter continues to uh, uh, argue is the point of submission. Uh, those sheep who come in with, those wolves who come in with sheep clothing, they have a problem submitting to the authority of God, the authority of the word of God, the authority of the church, and the authority of the pastor. False teachers, basic error, basic error, this the, the sin that they mess up in is they don't want to submit to the rule of Jesus Christ. And all religions, all, all religions, excuse me, all 
false religions do not think very much of Christology, the study of Christ. Also, verse 1, the terms here bought them. The term here, Peter is saying, we use many a theological speaking about human master, and the idea here is the master is over a household. The master bought slaves, and the slaves owned the master's allegiance to their sovereign Lord. We were bought, and God bought us. He gave his son for us, and so we owe him our allegiance. Peter writes the coming damnation to them. Here the passage describes in verse 1, describing the evil character of false teachers who claim Christ but deny his lordship. Yeah, I I love Jesus, but I'm going to live however I want. And most people think just because they believe in Christ, they're on their way to heaven, and they can live no matter what, they can think no matter what, and they can do no matter what they want. Swift destruction, Peter writes. This refers to a physical death or judgment and return to Christ. In the book of Proverbs 29, we read this. He who, he who offend and rebuke and hardens his neck will suddenly be destroyed without remedy. There's destruction coming. There's damnation coming to those who mislead people. Those wolves are going to pay a price. They're going to pay a price handsomely. There's also a text here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 to 10. Just write that verse down and, and look it up later. Verse 2 of Peter, chapter 2, verse 2. He said, many will follow their sensuality, as I said earlier. Because of them, the way of truth will be maligned. Now, in verse 2, the way of truth of Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ in John 14, 6. That is, why deny him as, as the same Lord? The, excuse me. Uh, John 14, 6. I like what John Calvin said about verse 2. He said this. There is nothing that disturbs godly minds so much as defection. Many will follow this destructive ways. And many people will profess to be Christians, but they will deny Christ's lordship in their life, refusing to live obediently to the Lord. False prophets, false teachers, they have lust for their flesh. They lust for the world, and they love Satan. They would never say that and deny the lordship of him, claiming to be a believer, but destructively, they don't, they don't, they know the truth, but then they want to twist it for their benefit. The way of truth, blasphemy. And that's verse 2. Their judgment long ago, verse 3, I'm sorry, verse 3. And their greed. So we see here that false teachers use destructive heresies, False teachers only want to satisfy their flesh. And false teachers can only think about greed. Greed. Verse verse 3. If verse 2 speaks of their immorality and talks about false teachers, now verse 3 says they are concerned about greed. They're concerned about their pocketbook. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul writes, for we never come with flattering speech. Paul is writing to the Thessalonians. As you know, nor with the pretext of greed as God is our witness. And then going back to Jude, verse 4, for certain people come in and they mislead others. And Peter's saying, they come in unnoticed, They come in and announce, not those on the outside, but they're in the church. Look at verse 3. Their uncontrolled greed. Peter observed observed that that their underlying motive is is not to love the truth, but they want to love money. And let me just make this clear. 
Money is not evil. It really isn't. The part of money is when you love it more than anything else. When it becomes your passion, when it becomes high in your list, instead of loving God more than you do money. And that's the problem here with the false teachers. They love greed. I remember a movie where a person in the movie, I think it was Wall Street, said, greed is good. It's not. It's a sin. God is going to damn these false teachers. He's going to damn these false people. He's going to send them to hell, and he's going to send them uh, to, to destruction. I want to bring you to the quote of the week on the screen. It's written by a, a pastor, a leader in Uganda. His name is Paul, Ka, Paul Kakuza. He's a, a, a leader there in Uganda. And I read an article an interview with this gentleman, and I like what he said. He said, the church in Uganda is committed to the teaching of the scriptures. Aren't you glad? Did you realize the largest church in America, excuse me, the largest churches in the world coming from Africa? There are also many deceiving churches there, just like the United States. The church in Uganda is committed to this teaching of the scriptures. I love to hear, I love when, when I read that. I, I, liked it. I love when I read that. And in many cases, we have turned down. Listen to this man of God. We've turned down aid in the interest of truth. Wow. It's in Table Talk magazine. There's an interview of this man of God. They turn it down. They turn it down because there's, sometimes there's strings attached to people's generosity. But this pastor says, we're turning it down because we believe in the scriptures. We believe in the word of God. It shouldn't have to come with attachment to people's gift. When people send us gifts in the mail, or when you send, or you, and you give gifts in your offering, you never say, well, you know what? You know, I don't know. Well, you know, you should go this way. No, you give it because God has placed it in your heart. And God has been faithful to us in his giving. And I thank you for giving to the missions that, that, we, that we participate, the, the networks of churches that we support and, and we believe in the scriptures and we believe in Jesus Christ as Savior. Bow with me as I pray. Uh, as we ponder what we heard and read this morning, Lord, we understand the seriousness of this message, the seriousness of Scripture. And my prayer is that we would, my prayer is that you would protect this flock, that would you not let them to be easily persuaded. I pray that this flock would never liken to have their ears tickled, that they would easily be persuaded to take another teaching besides what's biblical. I pray that you would protect us. I pray that also you would, you, that, that we would also rely on your word and scriptures in our lives. That we would be bold and have courage and stand against evil men, evil women that try to move us away to go to their corrupt, a, a corrupt agenda. I pray I pray, Lord, that you would draw others to hear your word and that they would grow in grace and knowledge. My prayer also, Lord, is that you would help this fellowship to develop a system of reading your word, of studying your word, of memorizing your word, and that we would repent of wasting time on the phone, wasting time on television, that we would repent of our sins making you number two when you need to be number one. I pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the tender Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen.